All right, well, good evening. Good to see each and every one of you. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to sing in just a second, but we have a couple of birthdays to sing to. We have Chris, who's here with us tonight. Brother Paul told me his son-in-law's got a birthday this past week, right? A couple of days ago. Friday, happy birthday to you. And then back on the uh, back row is uh, my granddaughter's got a birthday on Tuesday, Skyler. So she'll be four. We're going to sing happy birthday to them two there, okay? So let's do that first, and then we'll get into our song service. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, stand with me if you will. Page 345, Blessed Assurance. We'll do all three verses. On page number 345. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of wrath. Now burst on my side, angels descending, ring from above, echoes of mercy, the whispers of love. Oh, this is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Brother Kenny, would you open us up in a word of prayer? Be seated right now. We'll do some of the announcements. And and Miss Juanita had asked us that she is missing some uh, AirPods. They're in a black and gold case. So if you happen to see them around somewhere or if you happen to pick them up by mistake, you want to just bring them back up front here, maybe by the end of service, or let her know that they're there. Uh, they're showing to be here somewhere because she's searching for them, but where they're at, who knows? So we're looking for those. But uh, uh, good to have visitors with us this morning and again tonight if you're visiting with us for the first time uh, we'd love for you to fill out the, the little card in the back of the seat there and, and give it to one of the men of the church and then we'd like to meet you at the back and we have a gift for you for visiting we'd like to recognize that and then uh, to remind you on Tuesday night we will not be having services the services have been canceled for Tuesday night so it gives you a, an extra night to bake another pumpkin pie or you know make some more stuffing or something like that get everything ready for your Thanksgiving dinner uh, don't forget December 2nd ladies you have a Christmas brunch and ornament exchange uh, that's going to be at 10 a.m. there's a signing sheet back there so make sure you sign up for that so they get a good head count on who's coming and can plan for that and we have play practice tonight and 
choir practice, but it'll begin, it'll be next week also, so don't forget about that. That's just going to go on until Christmas play. Christmas play will uh, be completed, and then there won't be any practice for that until she decides to do something else with them, but choir practice won't stop. We'll, we'll go on to, to the next thing and start getting ready for Easter before you know it. It's good to have Brother Don, John Collier with us this morning to preach, and then again tonight, so looking forward to hearing you. We thank you for being here, and uh, don't forget to pray for our pastor while he's gone, him and his family. They're in Mississippi enjoying some time of rest and relaxation and spending time with their family, so don't forget to pray for them. Pray for Brother Bob. He's out sick. Uh, I think that's all the announcements. I miss any up there, guys? All right, good. All right, let's stand again. Page number 336, Jesus, I Come. We'll do all four verses. Stand with me. Page 336. page 347 be still my soul we'll do all three verses of page 347 
singing. You can go and be seated. Brother Andrew has our special. How wide is your love? That you would stretch your arms and go around the world. And why for me would a Savior's cry be heard? I don't know why you went where I was meant to go. I don't know why you love me so. Those were my nails, that was my crown, that pierced your hands and your brow. Those were my thorns, those were my scorns, those were my tears that fell down. And just as you said it would be, you did it all for me. And after you counted the cost, you took my shame, my blame on my cross. How deep is your grace that you could see my need and choose to take my place. And then for me, these words I'd hear you say, Father, no, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I will go because I love them so. Those were my nails, that was my crown, that pierced your hands and your brow. Those were my thorns, those were my scorns. Those were my tears that fell down. And just as you said it would be, you did it all for me. And after you counted the cost, you took my shame, my blame on my cross. Those were my nails, that was my crown that pierce your hands and your brow. Those were my thorns, those were my scorns, those were my tears that fell down. And just as you said it would be, you did it all for me. And after you counted the cost, you took my shame, my blame on my cross. See Brother Joseph and Sister Anna snuck in over here, and it's good to see them. I think y'all were here a couple weeks ago, maybe. Three weeks ago, I, I ended up missing you, so good to see you, and uh, good to good to have y'all here. So, Brother John, you come preach to us. John's Gospel, Chapter Nineteen. John's Gospel, Chapter Nineteen. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself today, and I thank you for your friendship. Thank you for listening well. I, I told Brother Wes at the, this afternoon, I sent him a message. I said, your folks listen well, and uh, I thank you for that. I have a good friend of mine named Steve Robertson. Steve 
for many years was the youth pastor and the senior saints pastor at the Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina. His dad, Brother Bobby Robertson, was the pastor. Steve was telling me one time that he took his senior saints down to Gatlinburg. And while they were driving, he just went up and down the aisle and was talking to several of the couples. And he asked one couple, said, how long have y'all been married? And she said, Brother Steve, if we make it till October, it'll be 62 years we've been married. He said, good night. What do you attribute the longevity of your marriage? She said, on our wedding night, we made a vow to God that we would never go to sleep angry. And the husband said, we spent many a sleepless night. I thought, well, at least he's honest about that. At least. John chapter 19. I appreciate that song. It goes right along with what I'm teaching and preaching tonight. It's amazing when we can discuss, talk about, parlay between each other. What does God really want us to do? What is His plan? What is His program? I want you to look down at number, verse number 25 here in John 19. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith to the disciple, or to, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Prior to what we have read right here, Jesus found himself in what we refer to as the upper room. He had what has become called the Last Supper. It's where Satan entered into the heart of Judas and he went and betrayed our Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. After Judas had left, Jesus took his disciples out of the Temple Mount area, out through the Gate Beautiful, the Eastern Gate, made his way across the Kidron Valley up to a beautiful place called Gethsemane. You read the life of Christ in the Gospels and you find that Jesus spent a lot of time on the Mount of Olives. It's a place that he loved to go, get away from the humdrum of the city, Get away from the crowds. And there he could be with his disciples. He then leaves the biggest group and he takes Peter, James, and John. And he takes them further into the garden and there he says to those three men, would you pray with me? What a wonderful request. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus asked you and me to pray with Him? I can tell you this, He does. Men ought always to pray and not faint. Ask anything of the Father in my name and I will do it. He requ it doesn't require, but He does make demands that we pray. You can be saved and not pray after you're born again, but you can't enter into a fellowship with the Son of God until you and I learn how to pray. I have to be up front with you. One of the hardest things I do in my own Christian walk 
is a matter of effectual, fervent praying. Of just getting along with God and pouring our hearts out to Him and making our requests known to Him and to believe that He's going to hear and answer our prayers. Peter, James, and John kneel there to pray. Jesus goes a little distance away from them and He prays. He comes back after a while and Peter, James, and John, they're asleep. And Jesus asked him this question. Could you not pray with me one hour? One hour. Can you imagine how long an hour is when you're praying? But when you enter into that effectual, fervent praying, it's just a minute or two. Because you are talking to the Son of God and He's making intercession for us. I personally believe, and of course you can disagree with me about this and I'll certainly not fall out with you about it, but I think when we get to heaven, you'll find out I'm right. I think our victory was really settled in Gethsemane. You remember what Jesus, that second time that He left Peter, James, and John, He goes there and He sweats and He's such agony of soul that His capillaries burst in His head and He sweated as it was great drops of blood. And He said, Father, that this cup might pass from Me. He wasn't talking about Calvary. You see, He being God, He knew that, yes, He was going to die, but He knew that He was going to raise Himself from the dead three days and three nights later. I think with all my heart, what He was saying is, Lord, for the first time in eternity past and the last time for eternity future, I'm going to take sin into my body. And the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And because I'm going to take sin into my body. Now watch this. He never sinned, but He took my sin. Paul said it, He became sin for us that he knew that when he did that, God the Father would have to take and separate himself from God the Son. That's why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't know how many times over the years, pastoring, preaching meetings and folks talking, they say, You know, I I, I know I, I can't question God. Jesus did. Always remember this. God's bigger than your questions. He can handle them. He can handle them. You still drag around this thing we call the old nature. The Adamic nature, that nature that's after the first Adam. And when you're born again, you receive the nature of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus. And that old nature can just doubt and question all he wants to. 1 John chapter 3, the writer John says this, Brethren, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. I've had people tell me, you know, sometimes I think I'm saved because I doubt things. I said, God's greater than your heart. God's greater than your heart. I don't ever try to tell somebody they are saved. But I don't try to tell them they aren't either. I get so tickled sometimes you hear people talk, I I don't think they're saved. I, I just don't see any fruit. You ever heard that? Now, none of us have ever said that. I'm talking about folks in other churches, all right? 
The fact of the matter is, there in Matthew where it says, by their fruits you shall know them, he is not talking about salvation, he's talking about false teachers. You'll know a false teacher by their teaching, by their fruit. And by the way, God never called you to be a fruit inspector. Nor did He call me to be. The only people who know a person is saved is that person and God. And sometimes it's only God. I remember my daughter Vonda was saved. I should say made a profession of faith when she was young. When she was 16 years old, we had a revival at our church. It really broke into revival. Scheduled for one week, it went two weeks. Second week, my daughter came forward. I mean, she was crying her eyes out, mascara going everywhere. I slipped around and I met her and she said, Daddy, I don't think I'm saved. I said, I don't think you are either. Oh, have you been doubting? I said, no, but if you're not sure, I'm not sure. So we knelt there and she asked the Lord Jesus to come into her life and be her Savior. Got home that night. My wife said to me in the bedroom, she said, do you think Vonda got saved tonight? I said, I don't care. That's between her and God. I do know this, she got it settled tonight. Now, if I were to biblically see what it takes to be saved, I'd say she was saved when she was young. But she didn't know it. You need to know what you're saved. You need to believe that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. If you died right now, you'd go to heaven. Jesus was going to be forsaken by His Father in heaven. It's amazing when you realize that the Son of God finally came to that place. And this is where the victory was won. Not my will, but thine be done. You know, I think there are times in our walk with God, our Christian experience that we have to over and over say, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. I think this is a decision that every true believer in Jesus Christ has to make initially, and we need to make it over and over and over when our flesh rises up and, and challenges us to do something that violates the Word of God. We need to say, Lord, not my will. Thine be done. Jesus then meets with His other disciples and Judas comes and they arrest Him. Take Him to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. They bring in men to witness against Him, to testify against Him, and even their testimonies don't even mix. And then some time around sunrise, they make a trip from the house of Caiaphas across the Temple Mount area to a place called the Fortress of Antonio. It was a home of Pilate. And the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews, they bring these accusations against him and the outcome is this. I find no fault in this man. I find nothing worthy of death. You see to it. And Caiaphas told him, said, we can't put a man to death because we're occupied by the Roman Empire. We don't have that authority, but you do. But I find no fault in him. And they said, if you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar's. And he feared Caesar. And then the Bible simply says in 
John 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. In the next few moments, I'm going to, with my limited vocabulary, to try to explain what Jesus went through for your sin and for my sin. As you read here, and it just simply says, they took him and they scourged him. That's not a whipping. That's not a beating. It is absolutely horrendous what the Romans did to the prisoners given over to crucifixion. And I want you to think about this as I talk about this for the next few moments. This was not just a man that they were abusing. It was the Son of God. It was that one that the Scripture says about Him that all things that were made were made by and for Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. This is the Creator. I've often wondered in my own mind what the angels were thinking in heaven looking over the precipice of glory and seeing Jesus being arrested and now to watch as the Romans scourged Him, as they mocked Him, as they spit in His face, as they plucked His beard out. I, I don't know this, but you don't know it's not true, so since I'm preaching, we'll act like it is, all right? I wonder if maybe Michael, that great war angel, when he looked down over there and saw what was happening, possibly he said to those angels under his charge, get ready. If Jesus calls us, we're going to go down there and we're going to beat up on some folks. Because that's our master they're doing that to. That's the one who loves us and cares for us and, and, and takes care of us. And we're not going to stand by. If he even thinks it, the songwriter says he could have called 10,000 angels. But the amazing thing is he didn't need 10,000 angels, nor one angel, because he was Almighty God in flesh. And at any time, he decided not to go through with it. He could have stopped. Jesus, the Son of God, the Roman soldiers take Him. And you know when you see a crucifix and Jesus still on the cross, He has a loincloth on. You read your history books, you'll find that the Romans did not do that to prisoners. They were going to exact to them the greatest shame that they could. And they would strip a prisoner absolutely nude. That was to the Son of God. They then would tie a leather strap around each wrist and around each ankle and suspend him between two pillars. Spread eagle with his whole exterior exposed. Then a Roman soldier trained in the art of scourging would take what was called a Roman cat of nine tails, a piece of wood three to four foot long, nine leather straps five to eight feet long. And in that would be pieces of metal or bone or pottery or rock, sharp and jagged. And then that Roman soldier with the body of the prisoner absolutely exposed, would lash the body with that Roman cat of nine tails. And as it would come around in the pressure, those sharp objects would penetrate the flesh and he would set it like he set a hook in a fish's mouth. And then he would give it a jerk. The Jewish historian Josephus said that many of the prisoners given over to crucifixion never reached the cross because they died from the scourging. 
He described how that there were times when a prisoner's intestines would just fall out on the floor from the scourging. We're not told how many lashes they did to the Son of God. If the Jews had done it, it'd be 40 stripes save one. Under the law, they could only beat a prisoner 40 times, and so to make sure they didn't break the law, they'd only do it 39 times. But it was the Romans that did it. They would beat a prisoner either until he expired, till he died, or till a prescribed amount was made, or until whoever ordered it said that's enough. We don't know. But we do know biblically about the severity of it. Isaiah chapter 52. The Bible says his visage, his appearance was so marred that he did not even look like a man. That was to the Son of God. They got a chair, mohawk throne. They took a scarlet robe and put it around his body. They set him on that throne and put a reed, a stick in his hand for a scepter. A Roman soldier had gone out and found a thorn bush and broke a limb off and made a crown of thorns. I've had the joy of being in Israel seven times and I always look at the thorns. It fascinates me. I've seen thorns three inches long. I've seen them five inches. I've seen them up to eight and nine inches long. Again, the Jewish historian Josephus said as they would place a crown of thorns on a prisoner, they then would take that reed, smote him on the head, and it would drive the thorns down into his scalp until the skin protruded over his eyes and he couldn't see. They mock him. Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him. They slap him in the face. Prophesy, tell us who hit you. A Roman soldier comes up and with massive hands grabs his beard and just pulls it out by the roots to the Son of God. Scourged him. The crown of thorns, the mocking of the scarlet robe, the scepter, the reed. And then the Bible simply says, they crucified Him. This was a form of execution that the Romans were very much aware of. Matter of fact, in Rome, on what's called the Appian Way, they would take prisoners and impale their bodies on big stakes and pour oil all over them and use them for street lights when visitors would come up the Appian Way into Rome. to the Son of God. They take Him up Golgotha. You remember this? Jesus said, No man takes my life. I lay it down a ransom for many. Always remember this. The Romans did not kill Jesus. They crucified Him. They beat Him. But they didn't kill him. On the cross, finally, Jesus says this, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. You know what he said? I'm going to allow my spirit to leave now. It's time for me to die. No man took his life. He laid it down a ransom for you and for me. He lays down on that cross. They don't have to force him. He puts out his hand. He watches as they drive that nail into his left hand and into the right hand. They cross his legs and they take a spike, usually around 18 inches long, and with a huge mallet, they drive it through his feet. They lift that cross up and put it in a hole and let it drop. 
Again, when you see a picture or, of the crucifixion and a crucifix and Jesus is there, they have ropes tied around their arms. Romans didn't do that. When they let that cross drop into the ground, all of His body weight rested on a nail in each hand and the spike in His feet. And in order not to suffocate, He had to with all the pain that was in His body, He had to push Himself up and He would open those eyes and get a breath. And He looked down to see who was still with Him. Every time I read this, and He looks down and He sees Mary, His mother, and Mary's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, Mary Magdalene, and John the Beloved. By that time, an older teenager, but very faithful to his Lord. You know, it's amazing. He referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And the Bible is very clear. The Holy Spirit didn't change that. You ever wonder why Jesus loved him? I think we can discuss it, debate it all we want to. But at the Last Supper, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And one by one, they begin to say, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? But when it came to John, he said, Lord, who is it? He knew it wasn't him because of the love that he had for the Lord Jesus. I think it's very wonderful that John was there, but I have to ask myself, where are the multitudes? Where are some of that 5,000 he fed on a hillside in Galilee? Where are some of the blind that he made to see? Where are some of the lepers that he healed and made it possible for them to go back home, be with their families and friends, and even to go to temple once again. Where are they? But I have to remind myself before I'm too critical. I have to ask myself, dear friend, where are the multitudes today? Where are those that He saved those that He over and over again has answered prayer, those over and over again that He has made provision for, been so gracious to, where are they today? Jesus looks down. He makes seven utterances from the cross. I'll not deal with any of them except in verse number 28. He looked at his mother and said, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. You know, in our society, if we talk about a female, sometimes if we think she's less than a lady, we use the term woman, not Jesus. He loved Mary more than you and I could ever love our earthly mother. But also Jesus being God hanging on that cross knew that there was going to arise a damnable heresy in years to come where men thought they would go to heaven through Mary. It's called Mariolatry. Always remember this. Mary was never the mother of God. She was the mother of the Jesus. She was the vehicle that God the Father chose to bring into this life our Lord Jesus Christ. I think when Jesus looked down and He saw Mary and He said, Woman, behold thy son. He wasn't saying, Mary, look at me. The Bible says about this time in His life, there's no beauty that we should desire Him. What He was saying to Mary was this, Mary, I'm breaking off all filial relationships. I'm becoming the sacrifice. I'm becoming the Savior. If you need a son, 
you need to look to John. And then he turns to that young man and he says to John, Behold thy mother. Mary was not any kin to John. Not a distant cousin. Nothing. But she was the mother of his Savior. I think Jesus was saying, John, I'm on this cross and I'm on this cross not because of my sin. I'm on this cross because of your sin. I'm dying for you. If I was not on this cross, I'd take care of Mary. I'd make sure she had a place to live. She had food to eat, clothes to wear. I would take care of her. But John, I am on this cross. And I'm there because of you. So John, what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to do what I would do if I was in your place and you were up here. Can I say it this way? I'm going to ask you to substitute for me because I'm substituting for you. Years ago, there was a saying that went around, what would Jesus do? A lot of people made fun of that. But that's really something we ought to think about. In my situation, what would Jesus do? In this situation, what would Jesus do? Because I think His word to John is His word to you and me. I'm substituting for you. You substitute for me. But then I want you to notice the last part of that verse. He says this, And that disciple took her to his own home. You know what he said? Yes, sir. I'll do it. I will do it. It's amazing when you realize that John the Beloved, that disciple whom Jesus loved, he said, I will do what you're asking me to do. That ought to be motivation for every one of us to not only give Him our soul and our life and salvation, but to say, Lord Jesus, I'll substitute for you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our heads are bowed. Eyes are closed for just a moment. I wonder, has the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit prompted your heart and mind tonight about the sacrifice that Jesus made for you, for me? Songwriter said it this way, how can I do less than give Him my best and live for Him completely after all He's done for me. I'd like for you to stand quietly to your feet. I can't decide if you ought to make some type of outward decision. I can, I believe, that the Holy Spirit has spoken tonight as we talked about the sacrifice of our Savior. Our brother's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. And maybe God's spoken to your heart. And you'll just come and if you can't kneel, you'll sit on the front row here and just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm, I'm here. I'm volunteering. I'll substitute for you because you have substituted for me. Dear Lord, speak to hearts. I have preached the message you laid on my heart. Now, Holy Spirit, speak to hearts. Our heads are bowed. Our brother leads us.
the invitation's open if God's spoken to your heart. Freely give, I will ever love. Trust Him in His presence, daily live. I surrender all.